Ephesa. Pasach is the Hebrew for open, and the passive command comes through as Ephesa, be opened. Several times on these very altar steps next to that ancient, and I mean ancient, font, you know its story, don't you? It was dug up, it was hidden underground for centuries. I've used that word, as one still does here in Ireland, with regard to the baptismal rite, when one places one's hands like this, opening the senses, be opened to the little child, that he may have all the pores of his soul opened to the word of God and the grace that it contains. It applies, therefore, to the Christian soul. It applies to us right now. For the word has a power in the air. It is hovering over our head. And if we're not listening, if we're sorting out our problems, in the air it will remain. It is good when one comes into church to ask the Holy Spirit for a word. Indeed, I read in the accounts of some of the teachings that apparently were given at Medjugorje, that Our Lady did instruct them early on, every time you come to Holy Mass, ask the Holy Spirit to open the Word for you. And the reason is that there is a grace at every celebration, a Word is waiting for you personally. The Lord is ministering to each one here personally, seeing your need and using the Word of Scripture and of the preacher to heal and instruct you. But also, he will use human channels in general, and he will use providence in general, his double language on a daily basis. He will use each other in friendship, spiritual friendship, holy matrimony, among friends, in communities, the clergy, whatever it might be, we are the word for each other. But for that to happen, we must be in receptive mode. The first part of the Holy Father's teaching on Holy Matrimony contains actually quite a lot on this issue. Knowing how central it is to any human relationship, but especially in the holy bond of matrimony. And in number 136, he has this, which I quote in extenso because it applies to anyone engaged in marriage. Dialogue is essential for experiencing, expressing, and fostering love in marriage and family life. Yet, it can only be the fruit of a long, and demanding apprenticeship, that's a powerful word, we're learning to be married. Men and women, young people and adults communicate differently. Now that's actually psychologically very profound. We have different modes of communication in different stages of our being. Children thump each other or hug each other. They're very open and immediately. Adults have other ways. Men have ways, and women have ways. Young people have ways, older people have ways. And they have ways! I remember one time blessing the houses in Sejano and coming to the topmost level of a high block of flats, coming into that lovely place of abode where there was a couple married for well over half a century, and when it came to confession, because often they want it when they can't get out, I said, well, okay, we'll separate you. And the good wife said, the sins of the one are the sins of the other. He knows them all anyway. That was how much they'd grown into each other. They even had their sins in common. And when one sees people of 80 plus holding hands in the street, it's far more moving than to see young lovers who tomorrow will not see each other again. Often through breaking it off by a mobile phone text, because they haven't got the courage to dialogue face to face. It's painless at a distance. Dialogue, question mark. Love, if it's authentic, grows and doesn't diminish with the years. Because after half a century, 
has all the memories shared. And I've known lots of travelling people who have never spent a night apart in half a century. It's devastating when the husband goes. They speak different languages and they act in different ways. Our way of asking and responding to questions, the tone we use, our timing and any number of other four factors condition how well we communicate. The timing is kind of important. There's a time to say something which has to be said. It can be messed up by choosing the wrong time. We need to develop certain attitudes that express love and encourage authentic dialogue. Now, this extends to other levels. First of all, the way in which we can be a home for someone else, ourselves. People are hurting out there and they come to us and they pick up straight away whether they're being received or treated as a number, brushed away. We can be a hearth and a heart, a home, a place of rest for souls coming to us. How? By seeing the unicity in time and in the universe. Each one is an eternity before me redeemed personally by Jesus Christ, and with that love of Christ, I will look into that soul and make that soul feel important, important enough for all I am at that moment. Wherever we travel, there is a little corner of the heart called home. So if we are already a hearth, if we are at peace in ourselves, we will heal. If we're ruffled and not at peace, we will be a source of more tension again for others. There is always a glory in a soul. It's rare that there is total, total depravity. However, a soul is conditioned by what it takes in. As we can get cancer through secondary smoking, so too we can get the cancer that is close to us. On this planet right now, dialogue is changing its nature. Already one can see whether a person can dialogue or not by seeing whether that person is exchanging during conversation. Many a time I've just had to listen and listen and listen, sometimes for more than one hour, and the person doesn't realize that there is no communication. It's output, output, output. And there is little point sometimes in trying to address that person's problem because actually the person doesn't want to hear anything. And one is tempted to say, what is the bottom line of, for instance, the New Age movement? We heard it in Italian. Si lo credi è vero. If you believe it, it's true. One can say that to many people who are so persuaded that what they say is all that has to be said. Batch. But something of that also can be found in certain cultures. Observe what is out there now, visible more than before because of recent historic events, in attempts to give a fair stage and a fair hearing to what is by now a heavy proportion of humanity. What will happen? The canons that we are used to in dialogue and logic will not be followed. In their place will very quickly emerge other laws, verbal 
equivalent of the law of the jungle. The law of the jungle is the law of the strongest. So, the loudest voice, the one that will not stop or let a word get in edgeways, will become aggressive in addressing things which have nothing actually directly to do with the problem. Anything to avoid getting close to the nerve which they cannot face. Oh, they cannot face it. Are they perhaps betraying themselves without realising it? It has been made public by people who have, by miraculous means, been touched by Trinitarian grace and come out of a certain culture. The, the origin of much of the behavioural patterns that we see in this culture are linked with the origin precisely of their faith. As on earth we are influenced and we get the cancer of another person in our soul, so too in a world religion, if one goes to the origin of a problem, one may find a far greater problem than actually was imagined. To put it bluntly, it has appeared from their own testimony by people who have come out of Islam, sometimes through Christ appearing to them in dreams and the equivalent, that having been touched and fulminated by Christian grace, they have realised where the problem was and how deep its level. The God of Islam is not the God that we know. As in classical times, in the Greek and Roman world, the patterns of behaviour of the gods, I think you know what I mean, invited indirectly those who worshipped them to get away with the same thing and same things. So too, to be taught from childhood that God is such and not such is going to have an influence over that child, over that future family, over that future village, over that future culture. If we have to do with a God who enjoys torture, pain, and it would seem eternal damnation, there's something fundamentally wrong with that religion and its origin. We are used to taking it for granted that Allah is great, Allah Akbar, and therefore he is the equivalent of our God the Father. But not all experts are agreed that actually it's the exact equivalent of our Deus Pater. It would seem that what actually happened in the earliest stages of Islam is that Muhammad was handling a monotheistic society and culture and he was simplifying it by taking one. Although at one point he backed down for a short while. It's the episode of the so-called Satanic Verses when to get peace at Mecca he tolerated worship of three gods for a while. Lat, Udza, and Manat. Inspired, it would seem, by a sinister force. What is uncertain is the degree to which the origin of this world religion is monotheistic as we know it. Because several things would seem to question it. If one looks and reads carefully at what was communicated by the 
Archangel Gabriel, question mark, to Mohammed in the beginning, one sees that this Archangel was encouraging him and then with a certain violence getting him to read and he was protesting, I cannot read. And he was becoming actually physically violent, it would seem. And it would seem that Muhammad himself, in the early stages, thought he was possessed and was told by a member of his family, you are not possessed, you are a prophet of the Most High. And he was flattered by it. We know that the religion that came out of that early movement was very appealing to males. Yes, there is prayer, but prayer is not the most demanding of the precepts. It favoured hugely bloodlust, the instinct of cruelty. It favoured hugely the man's needs on the sexual plane. Mohammed himself, at 51, married his favourite child bride, Aisha, and she was six. He deflowered her when he was 54 and she was nine. He ordered all dogs to be killed because of a puppy. He helped to behead six to nine hundred captives in one day. Insults against him and Islam require death. He had a woman killed for insulting him. He orders anyone leaving Islam to be killed. He curses his aunt and uncle to hell. He was made victorious through terror. He had a woman from Gamid stoned to death for adultery just after she'd been allowed to wean her baby. He got 20% of all stolen property. It would seem that he was spoken to by the devil in the episode I mentioned. He rode a burak, which is a half-winged donkey and a half-mule, to heaven and back, meeting Moses. He had, he led actually, 27 wars and ordered 47 others. He had over 50 sex slaves and wives. He never had a son, hence the Sunni and the Shia sects. He alone was allowed to have unlimited wives. He was ordered by Allah to marry his adopted son's stunning wife. In the interpretation of Islam, an important factor is the hadith. Hadith is the history rather than the writing, and they are classed in different degrees of certainty according to their origin and their proximity to their source. And in the corpus of hadith, we have what Muslim thought is because of what the Prophet did. An example would be what Gaddafi said some years ago when there was a treaty. He was taken up by his Islamic brethren for being too elastic with regard to the West and he muttered something in Arabic to them, remember, and it was the case which they got the message of. It was something that happened in Hadith when Muhammad made a peace treaty and then when he had enough soldiers gathered and weaponry prepared, he immediately broke it because his treaty was in view of a greater good to get victory. Likewise, when they were in one of these wars, the men needed women and he allowed them to have marriage overnight, marriage pro tempore, so they could have their instincts satisfied. And on it would go. If in a church I know in France at Etienne, a priest of God, having consecrated the Lamb of God, can be made to kneel 
at the foot of the altar where the spe sacred species have been brushed aside and desecrated. All this before somebody who is ordered to put on a mobile phone to film it. If that person can be offered in sacrifice to Allah in ritual sacrifice, it means there's something profoundly wrong with the religion that by now is invading our land and we don't realize what's happening before our eyes. I just finished with this. I had with me recently a person on retreat who was talking to a friend of hers who had been touched by grace and come out of Islam. He's now a Catholic. And this person said calmly, you are stupid. Meaning by that, you can't see what you're doing to yourself. The art of listening. When I behold the breath of many days that was on nothing spent, when I pay heed to sounds sent to the void, when I the rays of might see toward the night cast without need, then am I sad to see what had to be upon a moment lost, where tossed was all that was within without, for now I see what mighty matters move on movements small. O oh, Master, is here, tis here, the light, where on alone thou tie. For other than the space, twixt lip and lip, is nothing quite as wide as this that hides the whole of man. We are unblessed in messages ill-sent, for in much sound was found not much well meant.